thank you so much for coming tonight. We're going to start the formal part of the program, but I want to tell you very quickly um, how I came to have these pictures in my possession and in my stewardship, I should say. Um, when I was growing up, there was a lady who lived next door to me when I was a kid in South Gardner. Her name was Pauline Newt. Jeff, do you remember Polly? Very well. And she knew um, the daughter of the artist whose pictures we're going to see and that are featured in, in uh, two books that I've written about them. Um, and as Minnie was getting older, um, Polly was one of her guardians. And she said to Polly one day, I want you to have dad's pictures. And Polly thought, oh, well, it's a few photo albums and you know a few bits and pieces, that's great. And after Minnie died and they were cleaning out her house, she found box after box of glass plate negatives, albums, pictures, uh, postcards, all kinds of paper ephemera. And she had no idea what she was going to do with them. So when my husband Ron and I moved back to South Gardner with my newly minted history degree from the University of Southern Maine, she said, I have a project for you. We've got to do something with Herman Bryant's pictures. We've got to write a history of South Gardner. And what began a, a journey in the, in the early 80s, mid 80s, interviewing all the elderly people in South Gardner who remembered Herman Bryant, who remembered many of the places that he photographed. My first book was very much um, determined by oral histories and um, what research I could do in the basement of the Gardner Public Library. Remember, this is pre-internet and uh, nothing was digitized nothing was organized. Now we have a wonderful archives in downtown Gardner's library, a Gardner Public Library, and we have an archivist, and we have endless resources on the internet. And so this book takes advantage of all of that information and takes the Herman Bryant collection to the next level. And we learn a little bit more about Herman Bryant. Where the museum came in was we had all these boxes of negatives, and I didn't take many classes in preservation, but I knew that these pieces were at risk. They were in acid paper envelopes and the glass negatives, which were coated with a silver nitrate emulsion, were already tarnishing. We had curled up photographs. We had dusty um, albums. And in order to have these glass plate negatives made into prints that we could use in a publication or that we could safely take around to show to people for oral interviews, we had to have a contact print of each of these and so I approached the Main State Museum, the photography curator then, his name was Greg Hart, and I said, this is what we have. We're going to turn this over to you, but can you help us uh, have a copy of these made so that we can use them for our publication purposes? And um, he said, yes, and if you will catalog these in our system and put all the information that you can about each of these images, then we will have a deal. And um, so I began the process of identifying as best I could all of the images and cataloging them at the, at the, the type of cataloging that the museum wanted. And I put all the information in that I could. Had it not been for the museum and having a place to store those wonderful items, had it not been for Polly not wanting to see the collection broken up, all of these pieces would have been sold to collectors or maybe have ended up on the dump. And we, we would really be missing a, a treasure trove of life at the turn of the century. So that's my little spiel. That's why I am so dedicated to the museum. I've loved the museum since I was a little girl and it first opened. And I'm really proud to be on the commission and always have fun with the friends. And uh, so you will hear me make a few pitches tonight about joining the friends if you um, are so uh, inclined. So tonight we're going to talk about my second book, Around the Kennebec Valley, the Herman Bryant collection. And all proceeds from books sold this evening go to the Friends of the Museum. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> this is the cover, and I chose this cover because um, the man standing beside the camera is Herman Bryant's brother-in-law, Analdo English. To his left is Analdo's sister, Herman's wife, Viola, and their daughter, Minnie. And they always took pictures from this hill of the river, and that's called Nahumkeg Island, and it's just south of Gardner on the way to Richmond. 
And Analdo was also a, a, an avid photographer. And I learned a great deal about Viola's family doing this research. And um, I think that it was um, Viola's family actually that encouraged Herman to take up photography to begin with. Viola's father was an inventor of note and among his many patents were processes for the early photography known as ambrotypes. And he had a dark room at his house, among other things. He built a dam, he built a foundry, and he ground telescope lenses and um, microscope lenses for doctors at the last part of his life. So he was a very interesting character, very well known to the Vermont Historical Society, none of which I knew at the time of the first uh, book that I wrote. So this is Herman sitting in the parlor, and all of the books, uh, all of the pictures in this book, to my knowledge, are done by Herman Bryant, who was a mill worker at the turn of the century. And um, he really, his, his pictures really show us working class life in a working class enclave of a working class city in the state of Maine at the turn of the last century. And it's really a unique opportunity to see everyday life and to see families as uh, they're posed, yes, but they're they're natural in as much as they can be. I know that Herman and Viola, who both came from Vermont, um, did not come to Maine together. And this is a letter that Herman wrote to Viola, who was here in South Gardner, and she was working in a shoe shop in Richmond, and she was living now, I believe, with her Aunt Mary. And Herman was desperate to come and be with her, and he could not find work here. And so he was writing to tell her that instead of coming to South Gardner, as he hoped, that he was going to go to Barton, Vermont, to find work that his sister said, who was living there, said that he, he could find. So he says to her, it will be hard starting north when I had rather go east, but you will know how it is and you will not blame me, will you, love? And he signed it, your lover. Other letters between them were very stilted and formal, but this one um, I really appreciated. And I, I know you can't read it uh, per se, but it gives you a little sense of his personality when you see someone's handwriting and hear their own words. They eventually married in 1883, three years after that letter I just showed you. And they came to South Gardner and they purchased a home on Phillips Street and some land. And Phillips Street is kind of in the center of the rural part of South Gardner. And they purchased their white clabbered house with the black shutters. I only know that because I remember the house before it was turned, torn down. And this was to be their lifelong home. And this picture taken in 1899 also shows their only child, their only daughter, Minnie. And she was about 11 uh, in this picture. They were a very, very close family. This is um, Herman and Minnie on 4th of July, 1899, just a month or so before the previous picture was taken. Maybe they went to a picnic, maybe they had just been to a parade, but whatever, they are having some fun in the backyard. One of the things that Herman did when he was taking a, um, a uh, self-portrait was he would have in his hand the shutter button and he would run the cord to his camera underneath, either down through his pant leg if he was sitting in a chair, or under an item of furniture or a rug, and so he could snap the picture while he was also in it. This is an image of Viola, as she, this one's called Viola Sewing, and I don't have a date on it, but this photograph actually appeared in um, the museum's at home exhibition. It was one of the background pictures um, in one of the cases, and it featured um, women's work in the home. Viola was a skilled seamstress. She made all of their clothes, she made lace, um, and she was also an avid gardener, as you can tell by the house plant behind her. I have not been able to um, enlarge the photo enough so that I could actually read the calendar. I'm desperate to know when this was taken, but I think it's around the time of the previous picture, somewhere around the turn of the century, 1898 to 1900. Now, this little boy appears in lots of pictures, and his name was Frankie. And this picture, uh, he was about two or three when he came to live with the, his aunt Viola and um, her family here in South Gardner. Um, and I think he's about two or three here. But in my first book, I referred to him as Frank Bryant because that's what everyone said his name was. As it turns out, he's actually Frank Euler Hurlbert, Viola's nephew. And he was born in 1898. 
and he was only 18 months old when his father was murdered just a few miles from his home in New Hampshire in a still unsolved murder case. And there's all kinds of great fun stories about Frankie um, in the first and second book, and I can clarify it in the second book. But now I know that he stayed here in South Gardner till he was about 17 years old. And there was not always a closeness between Minnie and Frankie, and that will become apparent as you see some other pictures. But I also want to point out that they're sitting on a gravel bank behind their house. And this, for some reason, was a place that Herman took a lot of pictures. And I don't know what was so fascinating about this gravel bank behind the house, but it appears uh, as a backdrop regularly. Now, the house was torn down after Minnie died because the gravel underneath it was worth more than the house. Um, so that gravel bank actually did have um, a purpose later on. And this is a picture of the family. And um, through the benefit of some census records, um, I now know that uh, Frank lived to be the age of 85. He died in 1983 in Keene, New Hampshire, where he owned a greenhouse. And uh, maybe he got his love of gardening from his Aunt Viola. But um, there are some stories that, that were told about him, and um, I, I encourage you to read them in the book because I just don't have enough time tonight. But he lived a very interesting life, and but he turned out to be a pretty solid citizen in the end. And ironically, he died in 1983, and had Minnie uh, been closer and kept in touch with him, we might have been able to interview him before he died, but that, alas, was not possible. And I know now that um, Frank was referred to as Frank Bryant. This is a postcard that Herman sent back home. I can't, I can't really tell where he was or what he was doing, but he wrote to Frankie, and he, you can see, addressed it, Frankie Bryant, and he signed it love papa by 1900 we know from the census that all of herman's extended family were were dead he had one sister and three nephews and they had all perished by 1900 his father was dead when he was six years old his mother died and we know from the census that he was then living with a farm family nearby so he was separated from his family from from that early age and so Knowing more about him and more about his own story, I think, makes not only these pictures more valuable to the museum and future researchers, but also it adds a poignancy to um, the images of families and children, especially that he was a very sentimental person, as you will see. This view is from that gravel hill that I referenced earlier behind the Bryant home, and it shows the huge piles of lumber at the Lawrence Brothers Mill and the railroad engine turning house. Brian worked at this mill. He ran the lathe department. And there are many photos of the Lawrence Mill in all from all angles um, in the Bryant collection. This was taken October the 6th, 1898. You can see the river. The river is always a prominent um, place in his photographs. Any, any scenes, if he can put the river in them, that's the river is there. And this view um, is called, you can see that he's written right on the slide, thank you, Herman, view down the river showing vessels, July the 9th, 1898. Sometime after my first book came out, I got a phone call from a gentleman in West Gardner named John Ramsey. And he said, I, I have some papers that were found at an auction, uh, that, or that my, my in-laws bought at an auction, a paper auction. And um, they have Herman Bryant's name attached to them, and I recognize some of the photos from your book. So I went over to chat with him, and I knew that Herman Bryant um, exchanged photographs and letters with other photographers throughout the years because I had packets of photographs sent from other places with other photographers' descriptions of what they had done, but I'd never seen any from Herman's side. So from some faraway auction comes Herman Bryant's voice describing this photo looking down from top of hill showing vessels towing up river and one loading ice and showing more of our neighbors houses the vessels that the tugboat is towing are about a mile and a quarter distant the wind was blowing hard when i exposed the plate as you will see and you can see the smoke from the tug how it's blowing behind and so this is looking from the top of phillips street down towards richmond and you see sands island and um, off in the right here, you can see um, Haley's Ice House in um, Richmond. 
um, the Richmond line with Gardner is right over here, and it was Green's Ledges Ice House where the um, the uh, schooner was set up to load ice that had been uh, cut during the winter. I think this is kind of it's kind of fun to look at interiors of this period because you see how people lived or how they wanted to present themselves. All of Bryant's pictures are very carefully staged. This is Minnie's bedroom in the Bryant home, featuring her high school graduation photo on the wall above her desk and the Gardner High School banner, along with her new Remington typewriter, the uh, precursor to the laptop that college students take. <laughs> um, Minnie attended Washington State Normal School in Machias after she graduated from Gardner High School, and she taught elementary school for 42 years at the Forks, Belgrade, West Gardner, and South Gardner which is where she retired from. And this was Minnie um, at the Forks. And I believe from some other information that she began her teaching career at the Forks, which is in Somerset County at the headwaters of the Kennebec River. So when I say this book is around the Kennebec Valley, I mean, it literally starts at the top and goes all the way to the coast. We know from her obituary that she taught here as well as from local sources. And I believe it was 1916 based on a postcard from the collection addressed to her there and postmarked 1916. When the logging camps were in operation, there was a village here. There was a store, there was a school, um, there was a railroad station. And the Lawrence brothers owned many acres of woods here to supply their mill. And it is likely that Minnie obtained her position um, through Lawrence family connections. Not many students, as you can see, and a rather humble uh, schoolhouse. And this is the postcard that I reference. I just wanted you to be able to experience a little bit of what I couldn't put in the book, which is some of the primary uh, research. And this is, um, dear Minnie, pleased to hear from you. Wish you were here with your camera. It is very pretty here. There are people here by the name of English. I have three weeks more. How many have you? Then it is Gorham, Maine for you next fall. I had room 54, Agnes, Littleton, New Hampshire. Now, I have not documented Minnie attending school in Gorham. She went to Machias. But this postcard um, and from local sources I interviewed, I think really um, also show that Minnie was a photographer and that she started at the Forks. She looks quite young in that photograph. While he, his daughter was there, Herman um, did a wonderful series of postcards that he taped together and I wanted you to see what they looked like. And on the postcards, he annotated what they were and um, what his reactions were. Um, and basically he took the viewer from the woods up in northern Maine all the way down to the mills at, at, in, on the, along the river. And he has wonderful comments. This one um, is a close up of one of those postcards. And on the back, he wrote, this is the Kennebec River looking down river taken just below the fork or place where the rivers meet. And this is lumbering the old fashioned way. Um, we have some steam engines, but we have horse drawn sleighs and we have um, the very rugged camps. This one is uh, the Lombard log hauler, and it's the first tracked vehicle and the predecessor of the tank and the snowmobile. It was invented in 1901 by Alvin Lombard of Waterville, and he it could tow sleds of 300 tons or more and do the work of 300 horses. Maine State Museum curator Ben Stickney identified this as one of the early wood-fired models the museum has a later gas powered uh, example in their collection, uh, and you can see that when the museum reopens. I, I have a friend who's done a lot of research on the Lombard, and he said um, they were so huge and no one really knew how to uh, run them, I mean, uh, fix them. So when they broke down, they literally left them where they were because they couldn't haul them out and they didn't know how to fix them all the time. They didn't have the parts. And you can see from the size of the, of the men in this photo, see where the men are here. You can see how tall those um, wood piles are, and you can get a little sense, I think, of the danger of this industry. It's still dangerous working in the woods, but this was particularly dangerous. And um, in 1907, I found a Gardner Reporter Journal article about a gentleman from Hollowell who fell to his death from one of these piles at one of the local mills. This is the Lawrence Mill. This is um, a, a picture of the Lawrence, some of the Lawrence family. It's on Riverview Drive in South Gardner, and it's now the home of the Rhines family. Um, Sherburn um, was the oldest of the five brother partnership that started the Lawrence Lumber Company, and um, he had died in 1895. And this is his widow, 
um, on the, the porch, Julia Stanford Lawrence, who died in 1914. This picture was taken August 31st, 1902. And she is shown here, very interestingly posed. They're not together, they're not lined up or anything. I found this one very interesting. Um, that is her daughter-in-law, who is the widow of their only child, and their grandson, Pearlie. And um, Forrest, um, their son, had died in 1888 at the age of 32. So this is all that's left of Sherbin's family. And this house was right across from the Lawrence Mill. This is Charles Lawrence Jr., who was Sherbin's brother and one of 11 children of Charles and Eleanor Morrow Lawrence. And he was the grandson of David Lawrence, who was the person who came to South Gardner before the revolution and set up what became known as South Gardner, the part of Gardner known as South Gardner. And um, he was the youngest of this five brother partnership, but he was the driving force behind forming the Lawrence Brothers Lumber Mill. Originally, David uh, did his lumbering for shipbuilding. And so, but they looked for ways to use the wood that was not suitable for shipbuilding. So the lumber company was started in 1870, thereabouts. <clears throat> and though he was the youngest, um, he absolutely was the driving force behind that business. He was um, a legislator, um, and he was serving his second term in the legislature. Um, and he had gone out to the Buffalo, to the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901. And he was maybe even there when President McKinley was assassinated uh, two weeks before this, but he was on his way home and um, was held up in Boston ill, and um, he died of uh, complications of surgery in 1901. This is his little daughter, Gertrude, and um, this was his daughter with his second wife, May, and this was in my first book. Um, she's at the age of three or four in this picture, and she died, sadly, at the age of six in October of 1903 of appendicitis. Now, the picture was in the book. I was familiar with the picture. And I decided as I was putting this book together, I was going to include the picture of the tree because it tells us so much about the history of, of Christmas and, and how families celebrated. And it's fascinating to see the presence on the tree and the strong popcorn and the things that they the, the things that they decorated with. But what struck me when I could finally enlarge this picture was that photo at the very top of the picture. Can you see it right up here? There's a little girl in that picture. Does she look familiar? I never noticed it before because the picture was too small, but that's Gertrude, the little girl who had died just three months before. And it shows me a little bit of the sentimentality of the Bryants, that they would put that little girl as their angel on their Christmas tree that year. This is the Great Falls Ice House, February 1st, 1899. And this was one of the photos that um, John Ramsey had. And I have this lovely note from um, Herman Bryant, and he says, Ice cutting on the Kennebec shows ice house and part of lumber mill. This was the South Gardner lumber mill, not the Lawrence brothers. It was a very cold day when I took this picture, as you will see by the frost on the horse's noses. This ice house holds 45,000 tons. Ice harvesting was a major industry in the Kennebec Valley. It also was um, done in the Penobscot Valley. Um, and from about 1870 till about 1920, when refrigeration was more widespread and, and made it obsolete. Um, it was also, of course, harvested from ponds and lakes in the area for locals. But ice harvesting was important to the valley because it provided work for horses and farmers teams in the, in the slow winter months. And they came from as far away as Aroostook County to work in the ice fields. And all of the houses that had extra room would open up and have boarding for both the horses in their barns and the, and the men in their houses to make a little extra money. And even if they didn't have an extra room, the family was moved over to another space and they made room for the boarders because the money was really important to them. This is a boat owned by Herman and, Bron Herman and his neighbor um, and friend, Walton Thurlow. It's called the Minnie and the Mary. And here she's sporting her cabin and her, her canopy. And I know now um, that it was built at about 1915, the canopy and the, uh, and, the, and, and the cabin, because I was able to interview Mary Thurlow Rogers. Um, she believed that her father owned this himself, but um, I have this wonderful article from the Gardner Reporter Journal that says, quote, 
One of the finest crafts on the river, she is 28 feet long with an eight horsepower engine. She is named for the daughters of the joint owners, Minnie Bryant and Mary Thurlow. Now it's possible that Bryant sold his interest in the boat, but I, I think it's very clear that they went many places together and everywhere they went, Herman had his camera. And so we have these lovely pictures of the main coast. And I know now that this was sometime after 1915 because of the canopy on the boat. And this is called Squirrel Island. And many of you know where Squirrel Island is off the coast of Booth Bay. And this one um, is seen in my, uh, this is a picture from my first book. And this, po this picture has not been published. This is a picture of the Bryant and Thurlow families having a picnic. And it was taken by Frankie. And I know that because I have a companion picture exactly the same setup with Frankie sitting where Herman is. So they just took turns taking the picture. The two families uh, took many summer outings together in their boat, but Mary Thurlow Rogers at age 90 told me in a 1996 interview for the Capitol Weekly shortly after my first book came out, she said, quote, the Bryants were friends. In those days, next door neighbors were friends. That's just the way it was. Mary said the two families took countless boat trips and had clam bakes and picnics all along the river and coast. Still, the women and the children were not the ones who were close. It was the two men. And uh, Mary had some very interesting things to say about um, Minnie um, and, and, uh, and her mom. She referred to them as eccentric. And who knows what that means? Um, anybody who was different um, was eccentric. So what she said was they kind of kept to themselves and they did their thing. And um, so she also said, I can't imagine Minnie ever having a boyfriend. She just had to do things her own way. And that's just how she was. So that that interview took place because uh, a woman was in a drugstore. She saw the cover of my first book and she recognized it from having been on the mantle at her grandmother's house. And she got in touch with me and she said, the little girl standing up in the boat is my great aunt, Mary Thurlow Rogers, and she's still alive in Portland. Would you like to meet her? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I had a lovely afternoon with Mary and the story appeared in the Capitol Weekly and I had a, a lot more insight into the family. This is um, a trip that they took to Old Orchard Beach. This was um, in about in August of 1903. There were a whole series of photos of Old Orchard Beach. I thought you'd enjoy this. This is not how we usually dress when we go to the beach, so. <laughs> Um, I, I think I would be really uncomfortable there, but <laughs> it shows you that a lot has changed and a lot has not changed. Hi, come on in. This photo, um, this is in the new book. This is the USS Hartford, and this was taken um, in the Kennebec River off Bath. Um, and I read in a few places that in the 1890s, every American schoolboy could name all of the ships in the US fleet. It was such a big deal. But I had to rely on my, my uh, friends down at the Maine Maritime Museum. This ship was um, famous as the Civil War Admiral David Farragut's flagship in the New Orleans and Mississippi campaigns. And during one battle, when he was um, on his, his ship, the USS Hartford, one of the other ships in the fleet was torpedoed. Um, but it was they were mines, but they called them torpedoes in those days. And he took command of the situation and pulled the Hartford into the lead and said his famous, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Bryant was fascinated with boats of all kinds, and there are many of all shapes and sizes, but he was particularly interested in the maritime um, military. And um, this, um, according to uh, Maine Maritime folks, um, after 1899, the Hartford was retired and was used in training and, and cruising. And they think that it was then that it was on the river that Bryant took this picture. Um, in 1945, um, the USS Hartford, with all its glory, was uh, determined to be a relic, and she sank at her birth in Norfolk and was broken up as scrap. And this photo, um, all it had on it was muster ground, August 28th, 1898. And I thought, hmm, what could this be? And lo and behold, the Spanish-American War, very little spoken of or, or read about. This photo was taken at Camp Powers, just up the hill from here. And it was known um, then as Camp Powers because in those days, the camps were always named after the sitting governor. Um, it was named Camp Keys and has remained Camp Keys uh, since. But this regiment, the main first, was just 
uh, the main volunteer infantry rather, just had been brought back from Georgia where they had spent a miserable summer in a disease infested, overcrowded camp on the site of the Civil War battle at Chickamauga. They came back on the day before this picture was taken and there's Herman Bryant taking their picture. This uh, regiment did not see active duty, but they lost 41 men to typhoid fever. There are some other pictures, um, but they didn't, they're, they're hard. He, he didn't have as good a vantage point because he couldn't get really close to the camp. This, um, I found this one. Yes, sure. Yeah, yes. No, that's all right. I think he does. And if he doesn't, we will tell him. Really? It it very well could be. That would be important documentation. See, we're learning as we speak. This is awesome. This is how these connections are made when people see these pictures. It's amazing to me. Thank you, Bernard. Um, lots of the interior shots that Herman did, are, I find them very interesting in terms of how people lived, the furnishings that they had. Look at the way the books are carefully lined on the table, the stack of music behind the little girl and her starched white pinafore, the, the polished piano. I mean, it even shines and the photographs and the, the bric-a-brac. If this is the family's special room and they want you to see how proud they are of it. And I love these interior shots. Unfortunately, I don't know who this is and I do not have a date, but someday maybe somebody will notice this and say, oh, that's my great grandmother because that's happened as you can, as you know now. <laughs> I thought this uh, also unpublished picture of this little child, because you, all little boys and girls were dressed in these white dresses. Um, I found this interesting because of the crack. Um, he never threw anything away unless he was unhappy with the image. And I have a couple of examples of uh, glass plates glued back together. And this is one of them. Cute. This one, I have no idea who this little baby is, boy or girl, but he or she charmed their way into my book. And I'm hoping that somebody will identify this someday. Um, and again, you know, that's how I met Mary Thurlow Rogers. So. Um, Sometimes it's research and sometimes it's just dumb luck. <laughs> and I love this picture. Um, I like to see the progression of fashions for women. They really tell a story about um, women's burgeoning independence through this period. But um, this woman may be dressed up in her Sunday best in this fancy hat, but she's about to do something that you wouldn't consider a Victorian lady to do. She's about to lob a, a, a snowball at the photographer. <laughs> And I don't know who this young lady is, but hopefully somebody will recognize this one someday. And in, in a lot of his, this is an unpublished picture. There are a lot of pictures of animals and pets. Cats were suddenly in the Victorian era, very popular pets. And before they'd been tolerated for keeping down the mice, um, but they were, they were coveted pets in the Victorian era. And this is the Erskine family cat but I don't know the date. I don't know how um, Herman got them to hold still long enough with these slow shutter speeds, but. And this is um, another a glass plate that you can see has been mended and um, Minnie and Viola with some of their family cats. And there are some lovely kitten pictures in the second book. Now, lest you think that life in this period of time was idyllic, um, there are also some pictures, including this one that really stood out to me as an example of the rather hard scrabble existence that Maine rural life could be at this time. And you can count the children, you can see um, this was a staged picture, but they, Herman Bryant was trying to tell us something. Life was not always idyllic. This photograph, um, there are two photographs in the Bryant collection of Malaga Island. And Malaga Island, um, and I know this one was taken somewhere around 1910 because the schoolhouse picture that was with this was that that school was built in 1908 and it was the only building not torn down by the state in 1911 in one of the most shameful chapters of Maine history when the African American inhabitants of the island were um, summarily routed from the island and um, displaced some of them went to um, Maine's home for the feeble minded some ended up just floating along the coast homeless, but it was one of the most shameful um, chapters in Maine history and you can read more about it. It's been more research done 
since this book this appeared in my book but um, i'm proud of this picture because it does not look to me exploitative there were photographers took pictures at malaga and this to me is just like all the other pictures of maine families making their living eking out an existence on the main coast and it was featured prominently in um, an exhibit that the Maine State Museum did when Governor Baldacci apologized to the descendants of the Malaga Island re residents. This photograph was blown up about the size of this screen and was part of that exhibition. You can read more about that chapter of Maine's history. Now, this is a current mystery photo, and I have a title on this, Sardine Factory. But Museum curator Ben Stickney and I have looked at this over and he has done a little research and he doesn't think that it was it was a sardine factory He thinks it might be mislabeled and his the piping on the outside he thinks might suggest dust collectors so that it's maybe something from the wood processing um, uh, industry, but he couldn't guess with any confidence what the building was. And uh, he said in his email to me, it would take a lot more research and perhaps a lucky find to identify it. And I have to say, I've had some luck over the years. So I'm hoping that somebody will see this picture and help me identify uh, what it is. It's not in any book yet because I, I don't put in pictures that I'm not sure what they are. or couldn't give you some reason to have in the book, but this is a whole and it's my goal to fill in as many blanks as I can about the collection because it makes it more valuable to the museum and future researchers. I'm very much aware that I'm a steward of this collection still. And when I'm gone, all of the things that I've done to research and all of the connections that I've had in the community will be gone. And so I wanna make sure that we leave behind everything we know about these images and about the, the man who took them. And I think that's important to think about when you're thinking about, well, maybe I have something that I want to donate to the museum. Make sure you think about all the pieces and providing as much information as you can, because it makes those things so much more valuable. Herman took this picture of himself and Viola and Naldo in the 1930s. And uh, at this time, photography had advanced greatly. But Herman still took most of his pictures, from what I can tell, with the old glass plate negatives with his old camera on the tripod. And um, though there are some snaps, I don't know for sure if they were taken by Minnie, who had a modern camera, a brownie. Um, but I, I don't, I'm only putting in these books, the ones that I'm positive that Herman took. And again, you can see his hand is hidden. He's snapping that picture. So tonight I'm going to end with this lovely picture of Lithgow Library, where we are tonight. Um, it was simply titled Augusta Library and not dated. Now this building opened to the public in 1896, and I think this and the shots at Camp Powers and some of the other shots that he took in Augusta were taken about the same time. So I'm, I'm saying this was done circa 1898. I just want to thank the library director, Sarah Schultz Nielsen and um, uh, uh, Chris uh, Gibson, who are manning the desks and doing their job tonight because the library is open, um, for setting this up and allowing us, while the museum is closed, to have this space in order to present this program. And so I also want to put my little pitch in here for the Friends of the Museum, which I've done a little bit earlier. Um, you think about how exciting it will be to be part of the grand reopening of this museum and think about the events that we're going to be able to hold there and think about the work and the planning that we can do to help the museum have have its most proud moments in the future and you can be part of that so linda um Frinsco, the president is here um our development director ellen dyer is at the back table and um, we're going to sell books tonight and sign books I also have some copies that I've donated of my um, first book and of my second book, which is a different subject altogether, if you would like to look at those. And um, I will take some of your questions.